so it is really my pleasure to introduce to you a man who has certainly been involved on the scene for a while, and he's got a fabulous reputation. And uh, Stephen, a.k.a. the Barefoot Doctor, uh, is a man who is, has many talents. Not only is he a man of wisdom and philosophy, he is also a musician. He has many, many layers, and I suspect we're going to discover many of these layers this evening. But it's an absolute fabulous privilege to have him with us this evening, and I'm really looking forward to what he's going to say. So in a presentation entitled, What is the Truth? No pressure there then. We have <laughs> Mr. Barefoot Doctor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and also, before I forget, because I do tend to forget and be a bit rude like that, Andy Thomas is such a lovely, lovely man. With, he is, isn't he? Uh, yeah. Um, with, with a wisdom that I emulate, uh, what I, I aspire to, um, of somehow not drawing conclusions. And that is really the gist of what I want to talk to you about tonight. Now, Usually, I completely ad-lib my way through talks, and for this one, though, I felt it behooved me to really pay attention and be studious about it. So I'd be making notes um, that would make sure that I would include all the aspects I wanted to talk about, um, because I'm slightly out of my usual arena here, and um, only in as much as what I'm used to doing is talking to people who have come to learn a certain technique um, of how to improve the way they feel and act and, and the way life works for them. Um, and this can be quite specific. It could be teaching people Tai Chi, for example, even, or meditation or whatever. So I tend to be a bit of a comedian when I'm doing that because I just am a bit of a rebel, so I enjoy um, taking the mickey. I'm being very careful not to swear tonight. <laughs> which is not natural for me, I have to confess, because I do have this teenage habit of uh, doing that, but I won't, I won't, because I can understand with the film after, for them to keep going beep every few seconds would be a lot of work, which I don't want to put them through. Um, so I, I chose this topic, what is the truth, um, because it's really the, the essence of what my whole inquiry has been about since I was about one year old, I don't know, old enough to think really, um, having observed as a child how the adults, are, bearing in mind I'm 61, and as a, a, I was born in 1954, which was, you know, the war had only finished nine years earlier, we were still with the, the very strong echoes of empire, and in the way I see it, empires can only hold together when there are very strict social protocols and everybody is somehow willing or hypnotized into um, sticking to their place. And uh, therefore, there were, you know, morning Mrs. Smith, morning Mr. Jones, and all of that going on. You wouldn't really step outside of the set protocols very easily. And I remember, even as a tiny baby, when my mother, no, not as a baby, she wouldn't have been shouting at me then, but like when I was old enough to be shouted at for doing something wrong, she'd be shouting at me, and then the phone would ring, and it'd be, hello, my five face, with the telephone voice, and it was that, why do they all pretend so much? Why is everybody pretending so much? Um, this was the beginning of the, 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 uh, the inquiry, really. And... Um, yeah, that's good sound effects. I like that. <laughs> Perfect. Um, th it went on from there. I mean, I got a little bit more, uh, you know, as I grew older, it became a bit more complex and, and, and evolved the inquiry. Um, the, the, uh, I, I don't really want to go on a lot about myself, but just to give you a little bit of background. It started when I was about 11 with a Japanese Aikido master called Tio Honsai. Um, I was a, a bit of a fighter. I used to love fighting, actually, um, at school. I was at a boarding school. It, it, again, it was really strong post-Empire um, echoes there, so it was quite strict and all-male, except for the matron, who didn't really count. She was kind of like a guy as well, really, and, and so on. It, it was very, very male atmosphere, and it was quite sadistic and cruel. 
Um, and you had to kind of find your way through without getting caned or whacked over the head or slippered or whatever else. Um, that was part of the game. But it also bred a certain pugnaciousness, should I say. Um, and uh, to kind of uh, make sure that you didn't get your territory, so to speak, trampled upon. You had to fight, and I was good. I used to, because my dad was a boxer, he taught me how to fight, but I was doing it too much. Got into trouble, and my father happened to know somebody who knew this Japanese guy. He'd come to London, was um, in Harley Street, had set up as a healer. Um, he used to treat Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden and this one and that one. And he was uh, sponsored by Lord Cawdor of Cawdor Castle from Macbeth fame. And um, I was obliged to be in a class with five adult, very highly achieving males, real alpha, alpha males, Lord this one, Lord that one, and so on, and me. Um, and they wanted to learn how to do healing. They wanted to learn how to meditate. I had no interest in healing or meditating. And these things were just like, I didn't know what they were for other people. But the fighting, because it'd be like James Bond to do chops and clever shit. I, sorry, beep. Um, <laughs> That really appealed to me. Um, but I had to go through the other stuff because you wouldn't argue with this guy. And in fact, he was the first adult that I've ever encountered that I didn't have at, at that age when there was that great gulf between adults and children, um, where I had absolute total respect for him because he really was real. He wasn't faking at all. He was just himself. And um, I'm, the first interview went... You know, basically, so you, th you rate yourself as a fighter, do you? You know, you know <laughs> not bad. He says, so punch me in the stomach. And I, I thought he was joking. No, he punched me like that. And I, and I did a half-hearted punch because he was an old guy. And I'd never thought of ever hitting an adult. That was just out of my realm altogether. And it wasn't hard enough. It, punch! Then I went bang like that really hard as I could. And it was like punching into an airbag. <laughs> there was nothing there, but really nothing there. It was astonishing. And I, in my stunned state, he goes, Ki, super ki. And from that moment on, there was no question that if he shouted a command, I would obey the command. And that, I think, is what gave me the uh, respect for law and order that I wouldn't have had otherwise. I think it actually stopped me becoming a criminal, probably. Because I probably would have become a gang guy. I think it was, in my, it was, it was appealing to me, shall we say. Um, in reaction to the stiffness of everything. But then, along with that, came the hippie thing as well, because I was tall for my age. It was the late 60s. The Beatles were my messiah. And I um, was brought forth into the London hippie scene, which was very, very exciting at the time. I couldn't really define what it was all about, but there was definitely, as I'm sure many of you can recall, a something, there was something when 250,000 people sat in Hyde Park watching the Rolling Stones together, not all different stages with the, the, the attention all you know, dispersed like they are at festivals today, um, like it is rather, there was an amazing sense of unity. And I think that feeling of unity, being with family, being with humanity as family, is really what touched me most deeply. And I, I, I had this growing sense that my whole life was really just about somehow being part of um, the, the drive to create unity in humanity, however that could be. And that is why it's such a privilege to be here with you now. And it's specifically um, important to me because I, I, uh, I, my work is really varied. It's essentially about ameliorating the human condition. And my template is the ancient Taoist template. I've been practicing, I mean, Aikido really is Taoism. It's Do is Tao, Qi is life, uh, Qi rather, and, and, and I is their version of Tai, which means the supreme prim ultimate. So it's the same as Tai Chi, um, but, it, but it's Aiki Do. You know, the, the, the way of uh, the universal chi, if you like. And from there, I, from the age of 18, I switched to Taoist stuff and Tai Chi and all the rest of those things, Chinese medicine, everything else. Um, 
I just want to kind of commune with the baby for a moment. And part of my work, I mean, I, I do very exciting things. I create electronic healing dance music. I've just completed a mammoth um, project. Well, it's being completed for me, in fact, by a, a guy who does the finalizing on things. And I do do, I have done events in Ibiza and London and New York and Berlin and all over. Um, where I, 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 I started this conscious clubbing movement where you can go to a club, you can dance and party without taking drugs and get high, or if you are taking drugs, you get high anyway, but it stops it becoming just a, a kind of going through the motions. It's no longer formulaic. It's sort of harking back to the 90s where there was that warmth and the love, which was harking back to the 60s where there was the warmth and the love. Um, that's just one aspect, the celebration aspect. Um, one of the things that I'm, I do is uh, I get uh, um, invited to go and hang out with people who are fairly big players on, on the world stage and uh, to be their consultant, um, you know, like the spiritual guy to have around. But, yeah, I mean, somebody who people can bounce off because if you're dealing with uh, high-level geopolitics or you're dealing with um, a high-level business or whatever, it's nice to have someone who's not competing, because I'm not, I couldn't anyway, um, who is there to provide truth, really. I will go into and qualify what I mean by truth in a minute. But just a reflection of what, what game are you really playing here? Because if someone knows the game they're playing and can acknowledge it, they can play it better, for sure, and they can have better results. And I'm, my concern is to somehow influence people to be more loving, more, more open-hearted to humanity in general. And as a result of this, and also having an extremely keen interest in trying to uh, discern what is going on in the world, um, you know, behind all the incredible noise of the, the media misinformation, disinformation, um, and Having met some of these guys that we all kind of know from the news and everything and know what it's like being them, I mean, I, mean, I can empathize, I understand. I've sat at dinner with people who, who, you know, where they, oh God, have I really made a big mess of it? Somebody who's just done something like, um, uh, you know, sorted out the referendum for Brexit, for example. And, you know, to see somebody who was the key guy or one of the key guys in that whole thing go, oh, have I really made a mess of it here? Um, is really quite, uh, dramatic to understand what it's like. To, um, so at the moment, I'm getting a lot of feedback from around the world. I'm, I'm seeing things with my own eyes, and uh, the uh, and I'm talking with uh, ecologists and geographers, and uh, I could go on, economists, bankers, and all the rest of it. We are in an extremely precarious situation right now. And I'm, I'm moved, I am. I'm, I've been nervous about this talk, not just cause about this talk, because I am nervous at the moment, I have to confess. I'm nervous about what is going on in the world. And I'm not actually even sure if it's got such a strong momentum that there might not be anything we can even do about it. Um, I, I'm an eternal optimist, so I have to go with the idea that we can. And I think maybe we can, but that's as far as I could go. Now, I feel, as part of my job in my internet world, you know, I've got a fairly, like a, uh, what do you call it, like an online university, really, that's a bit grandiose. It's a school of Taoism, really, uh, online. And uh, so it kind of behooves me to give a view, to pre present a view, and to present the positive view, because I don't want to make bring people down, I want to lift us up. And trying to discern what the positive line is that isn't just nonsense, not just kind of, yeah, it'll all be fine, just think positive and everything's going to be okay, we can change this and all the rest of it. I don't actually know if we can, I don't know, but um, I can see certain things that must be done regardless because at times like this, on the one hand, you have to have a really broad perspective to get some idea of what's kind of going on. Um, and on the other hand, to project too far into the future isn't really helpful. You know, when in a crisis, which we are, there's no question about it, and it's not a sudden one, it's been coming, as you know, since, well, I mean, it's, we started tracking it in the late 60s, really, this started, you know, it was becoming obvious to people who were awake that there was trouble coming down the line because of the way we were using the planet and so on. 
Um, so to, to have long-term views about what should be done is, I think, for me at the moment, impossible anyway. But with what we have, we can, we can do things with what we have now. And the way I see it, what we have now is the human family. And the human family is nearly 8 billion strong. And if I see that as an organism, like as one person, really, and I'm the doctor and I'm looking at that patient, I have to diagnose what's going on somehow and have to give a kind of prognosis. Now, I have helped a lot of people through what was diagnosed as fatal cancer. Um, and, uh, and they've come out of it, uh, you know, apparently miraculously. I mean, not totally unaided. I've, I've helped them with, they've had cannabis oil and all sorts of stuff to, to help. Um, but I have seen miracles occur. I even did it with myself. I was pronounced, um, I had three months left to live, I think, three years ago. And, uh, and I seem to manage to disappear it within about three weeks by concentrating for a moment or two. I, I don't know if that's really right. They might have had it all wrong in the first place, but apparently not. Um, so I know that things are possible. There are so-called miracles possible. And it's really that that I'm voting for. It's that that I'm putting my energy behind, that there could be a quantum shift, a sudden quantum shift. Now, I'm not talking about anything idealistic because I'm not that stupid. I know that whenever you have a positive movement, you will also have its opposite. And we are seeing that polarity really strongly played out at the moment, and it's moving very quickly between the two. Um, but in other words, it's not over till it's over. And I remember saying to my, one of my youngest son, who's now 28, about oh, four or five years ago, I, I had, again, I, I, I had caught swine flu on a plane to uh, Germany. It had made my left lung collapse, and uh, I, I was in hospital in Ibiza recovering, and I phoned him up in America. He's a producer there and DJ. I said, man, do you think I'm finished, man? Do you think I'm out? Do you think I'm done? Am I done? And, you know, which is quite a raw thing for a father to say to a son. Am I, am I over? And then he goes, no, man, you're still alive. You're still alive. You're in the game. It's not over yet. You're in the game. And it's that spirit, really, that I feel I must promote. And yet, realistically, um, I was speaking... Let me give you just snippets. I, I was speaking to someone I'm helping uh, in Germany just before on the phone. And she's a very, very brilliant, brilliant, brilliant woman. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Kind of um, a light artist, really. She makes art out of light. And she's involved in all sorts of big scientific projects and these massive corporate deals that, you know, way beyond my scope. She's proper, in other words. And uh, she lives in Bremen, and in the north of Germany, and um, in, a, in a funky area of town, apparently. I haven't been there, I don't know. But it's like the, the, the regenerated bit where the cool people live, the arty people. And she's really, really open-hearted. And one of the things I've been helping her with is this idea that you have to open yourself to others. And the kindness, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, is so important, rather than closing off and, and, and resisting this was originally people at work and so on. But she was describing today how refugees um, have moved in that area in quite some numbers. And um, she said, like, the, the woman in the downstairs apartment has been burgled three times in the last month now. And um, the guys, the Muslim guys there, don't have much respect for women, especially if they're not married, don't have a wedding ring on like she doesn't. So when she walks to the local shop, she gets taunted and, 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 and people are rude. Now, she completely understands, as, as do I. Had I come from um, outside of, the, of Europe to this uh, island of affluence, relative affluence, um, knowing that there was prejudice against me, I'm sure that I would be inclined to react in, weird, in unsociable ways as well. I'm not judging anybody at all. I always have to try and empathize. Um, but you can see how there is this tension building, because it is, it's building. The danger there, of course, is that the, the far right gain, gain ground because people lose their, um, their patience. And um, the, I was in France a week ago, and the, the young, it's just snippets. Um, the guy, oh, I don't know, he's um, mid-20s, very intelligent, university educated, incredibly sensitive, beautiful young guy. 
Why? Why, why did they leave? Why, why? I don't understand. Surely it can't be better for them, the Britain leaving the EU. Why? 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 Um, it's so sad. It's like the EU's broken apart in people's minds now. It's the end, really. And it's not the mechanics of it. It's the dream. And it, it's the, the story which was of unity. And of course it was flawed. We know that. Um, I'm not here to argue one way or the other. I'm not here to talk about politics at all. But just the sense of family and unity, which seems to have been shattered by the one uh, party that no one ever expected to do it, um, here was seen as a, as a place of stability and, and moderation, and now is seen suddenly as a firebrand, and people are quite shocked by it, but genuinely shocked, and it's still going on, or it was the end of last week anyway. Um, this sense of shock, and you see it as you walk around in, in Provence, the, the places of, not that, I mean, the, you can see there's a crumbling occurring. Um, people are losing their sense of pride, uh, you know, pride in being human. There's a sort of a tiredness to people. Um, the uh, situation with, um, wh while this was going on, it was inevitable, of course, that China and Russia would make moves. So China did actually make the most aggressive move they've made in our history. In fact, well, yeah, actually it's true in our, in our history, um, by firstly completely ignoring the ruling of the International Court in The Hague that said that the Spratly Islands, which they've um, you know, developed and put military uh, bases on, uh, are not theirs, they belong to the Philippines. And um, they just said, we don't care, we're not interested in what the, the, the Hague Court says, who cares? And they said to America a couple of days before that, in my own words, we know that your military is still a little bit stronger than ours. However, if you carry on patrolling these waters, we will inflict damage on you that is really gonna hurt. I have never, ever heard China talk like that. President Xi is the most powerful leader, probably even more powerful than Chairman Mao. He has the whole thing completely and utterly tied up. So it's a proper, proper dictatorship there. And it's one, it's a popular one as well, bear in mind. The people are behind him, so is the party. And uh, he lived in a cave for 18 months because his dad was chucked out of the, uh, you know, he was uh, banished. And as the, uh, a prince of one of those guys, um, he was obliged to as well. He lived in a cave for 18 months, apparently, which is where he, he developed his doctrine and his, his approach. Now, this guy doesn't mess around. China, bear in mind, are the original martial arts masters. They know how to do it like nobody else does. When they, and one major rule of martial arts is you, you never go on the offensive unless you are really ready and you really are prepared to follow through. You never make a threat you're not willing to, to, to follow through with. The, you have a lot more strength generally when you're in the yielding, receiving position when somebody else aggresses against you. So this is an unprecedented move, and it, it, it's serious. It's to be taken seriously. I'm not suggesting they're going to move on Taiwan yet or anything like that, but they're definitely sort of, uh, you know, there's a bit of elbowing going on. Putin, of course, is a genius. I mean, I know the, the propaganda against him is really huge, but that is totally misinformed, really. Um, I, I, I do know, I don't know him, I haven't met him myself, but I do know people who do know him well. And the, the, who agree with me, I'm only talking as a martial artist. When I look at his eyes in a photograph, I see uh, a fellow martial artist. He's the fifth damn black belt in judo, which is high, high. To get to fifth damn black belt, you have to have integrity. You cannot possibly, and I know this, you cannot reach fifth damn black belt if you don't have true integrity. Now, you may not agree with his ways, you may not agree with his apparent strategies, but he does have integrity as a human being. And when you hear him do his speeches, he's obviously not saying everything, but what he does say makes sense, as opposed to when you listen to say, I mean, I think Theresa May, she does make more sense. She's quite coherent. And strangely, I'm surprised to say, I really like the sound of her voice. She, she moves me. Um, I even almost cried listening to her saying a couple of things, just because I suppose because it was, uh, maybe because she's a woman, and I don't know, but there was something really touched me um, about, wow, she's got hold of it here, all right, well, at least there's that. But um, David Cameron is, I think, a really lovely man. Um, he lost the ability to communicate from his soul when his kid died. I don't know if, you're, if you remember that. Um, from that point on, he couldn't speak from his soul anymore because he had to close down. He never had time to grieve. But because of that, the gobbledygook that would come out, this kind of insincere-sounding nonsense that would come out of all of their mouths, really, um, 
is not what you get from Putin. You get this clear, straightforward thing. And he said it really, really clearly. Um, he is not going to tolerate this missile defense shield on his borders that America has just doubled, um, or the NATO has, rather, um, any more than America would countenance having the same thing along the Mexican border. You could understand that. Um, he is the most powerful guy in the world, maybe le after Xi, I, don't, I wouldn't really know. He's certainly the richest guy, uh, by all accounts, worth about 400 billion. Um, and he has got the biggest, he's got the most efficient, well-armed and well-oiled uh, gang of any of them on the planet. And that's what he is, you know, he runs the big gang. Nobody's going to argue with him. There is definitely the potential for trouble, in other words. Uh, if Donald Trump does get in, if he does get in, um, the advantage of that is that he respects Putin and Putin him. They know each other uh, anyway. Um, and he is not probably going to start trouble with him, which means he's probably not going to start trouble with China because they come as a pair. That's good. That's good. If Hillary gets in, which personally I would prefer, although it's very not like exactly like the greatest choice in the world, um, we do have a, a problem in that she has a, 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 she's committed to um, teaching Putin a lesson and she doesn't hold China in very high esteem either. Um, she was one of the ones that donated a vast, I mean, a massive amount of money to the Soros Fund in Ukraine, which fueled the finance of the coup there, for example. So it's trouble with her. I mean, I think I prefer, I think her hairstyle is just slightly less bizarre. Uh, that's got that to go on at least and I did used to really love Bill I thought he was a beautiful guy he had a lovely vibe about him he had that presence of, of, of warmth and so on um, n nonetheless between November and January it's quite possible that China will make a move I would if I was them because it's gonna it's a you know the place is unguarded really um, and if not who knows who knows what's gonna happen what we do know is is that things are in a heightened state there's a lot of elbow jostling. I think it might just be that. Um, I, I personally would like to think it's just that. We do also, though, have this amazingly strong pull towards the, um, the divisive and the xenophobic and the us and them uh, and the kind of meanness of spirit uh, that I see not just here, it's, it's all over the world. And, and it's understandable. I totally understand it. I'm not blaming anyone or judging anybody, but I do see it. Um, uh, th there's a problem. I mean, in Europe, for example, I, I know Ang one of Angela Merkel's geopolitical advisors, and he was saying to me that the, um, what they actually expect, they know that there is a potential for about 100 million people to want to be coming into Europe. And interestingly, this is not said with fear. Surprisingly, this was said with a huge compassion that from... Angela Merkel's point of view, what are we going to do? They're people, you know, we, we must look after them. And uh, although it will be an incredible upheaval in Europe, we have to accommodate them and it will actually do us good because the rebalancing will be one of the main factors that will help reduce the disparity between perceived wealth and perceived poverty because it is mostly perceived. It, it's not... The actual poverty line has not as low as it was. It's never actually been this high globally in, in human history. We've never really had it this good. That's the irony of it. It's just that the perception is that because there are people who are billion, 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 billionaires, um, and you know, you're not a billionaire, and that maybe when there's, the economy drops below a certain point, the idea that you'll never be able to f fulfill your dream leaves a certain frustration, and then there's that wanting to attack and, and uh, a sort of jealousy of that, uh, which is really also one of the things that's running quite rife at the moment. Um, this tendency to divide. Now, I, uh, I don't know. I, I, I w certainly wouldn't say this with any disrespect because everybody has their own way and we all have a part to play in the drama. But we do know, for example, that there are many people on the planet that are Satanists. There are many people who devote their attention to creating discord and disharmony and destruction. Again, I say I'm not judging anybody because evidently it has to be done for some reason. There has to be this yin and yang thing going on. And it's occurring to me, because I have quite well-developed psychic um, power, that 
um, there's been a lot of activity building from that quarter, and the result is discord. We're seeing that. I'm not saying they made it happen, but by any means, it was coming anyway. But there is a sort of a, there's a, there's a force wanting to accentuate it. Um, America is kind of probably veering towards some kind of civil war because between black and white. Um, that's also being agitated by both sides. And th th there's all these things, plus the global economies on the slide because China's thing has really gone. I mean, they're, they're not producing as they were. And there's no big powerhouse on the planet at the moment at all. Uh, and there's a reason for that, and it's a very simple one that everyone seems to forget, is that our resources are running out. That's what economies are based on. We just don't have resources. I mean, yeah, they keep finding new oil and stuff. It's very expensive to drill. And we have reached, I think, you know, finite oil a while back. Um, you know, we're almost out of copper. There's a serious problem with water, uh, although I'd love to know why we couldn't kind of somehow ship it from the Arctic and Antarctic, which is another problem and the real problem behind all of it. Um, is that the sea level's rising because the ice caps are melting exponentially faster all the time. And they're going to suddenly jump very soon because the sea, which is the main carbon sink, is pretty much full up with carbon now. It's like, you know, the barrier reef is, is um, bleached now because of the acid, because of the heat in the sea. And um, there's a massive, massive deposit in Siberia of methane gas, zillions of tons, I can't remember how many, the ice cover of which is melted now, really, and it's all starting to come up. This is the year it's happening. Well, this is going to exponentially heat the thing, and it's all going to, the weather, the sea levels, and all the rest of it. We do have a serious ecological problem on our hands. Um, Putin has actually made it very clear that in a, there is this mutually assured destruction thing is old hat now, that we can have a nuclear war if we want, because we have neutron bombs. Neutron bombs basically will vaporize humanity while keeping the assets intact, which is what any you know, uh, army would want. You don't want to destroy all the assets, you want to keep them there. And they can do that. They can have limited nuclear war with, with neutron bombs and all the other mad weapons that they've been inventing. Now, that's on the one hand. I'm not doing this to keep your frequency up, keep your frequency up. I'm going to make it feel beautiful. Don't you worry, don't you worry. What I'm doing is I'm not bullshitting. I'm not being whatever the word is, <laughs> you know. Um, I want, I'm not going to be fake with you. I want to be real because it's important. Um, uh, so um, we are on the cusp of something for sure. Now, whether we can flip this the other way or not, I really wouldn't know. Um, there are a couple of things that really encourage me. One, if you remember, when they bombed Baghdad or during that invasion, there was a clip, I don't know if you'd have seen it on news TV, of after Saddam had been toppled and the whole place was in ruins, in Baghdad, in the souk, there were two old guys trading with Saddam Hussein banknotes. So they would keep trading with the notes of the guy that had already been deposed because they didn't have any other notes to trade with, which indicates to me that the urge to trade is so strong, it's so innate, that it doesn't really matter what happens. We'll somehow reorganize ourselves and keep trading. Now, I don't know if the urge to trade is stronger than any other urge in humanity. I wouldn't really know, but it's certainly a strong one. And that's encouraging, because it means no matter how wibbly-wobbly the whole thing goes, no matter how far the structures break down, there will always be this tendency to stay organized. Um, that's just one example of how utterly ingenious, instinctively, instinctually ingenious humanity is. Um, so that's the one side. I have incredible admiration and respect for the ingenuity of, of, of humanity. We have sent probes going past Pluto, for example. Um, it, it's astonishing what we can do. And the complexity of our interactions and transactions on a daily basis is, is staggering and near infinite. We are amazingly brilliant, and at the same time, we, and I wouldn't include any of us in here, but we have to take collective responsibilities, are utter imbeciles as well. And the trance of imbecility, as I would call it, is definitely seeming to grow. And by this I mean, it's a combination of many things. One, Google, so that if you um, need to know anything, you Google it, and therefore facts no longer have great currency. When I was a kid, when you learned a fact, you had to go through a palaver to get it. You go to the library, you look in a book, 
And you remembered the fact because it was worth something to you. No, you don't have to anymore. You just Google it and then you can forget about it afterwards. Um, similarly, sat navs. I mean, one of the most basic functions of a human being is, is navigation. Uh, when we lived in the wilds, we had to be able to navigate and you know, take coordinates and, and, and triangulate and, and get from one side of the hill to the other and figure out how to get places. And I remember when I was young driving, I know the world pretty well. I, mean, I could drive pretty much anywhere in the world without sat-nav. However, over the last three, four years, I have succumbed because eventually, you know, if the car comes with a sat-nav and you think, all right, have a little go. And it's very useful sometimes, I know that. But I have noticed that my navigational skills have definitely declined. I get confused in a way that I never got confused before. Now, this could be senility or the onset of senility. I have to you know, acknowledge that possibility, but I think there's something more. So the Google effect is one thing. Secondly, um, what I do notice, I, I don't watch TV very much. I don't really enjoy the, the physical sensation of the gamma rays. Um, but I do listen when I'm in England and I'm driving to Radio 4 pretty much all the time, but only because it's the only station that I really can be bothered to. I can't be bothered listening to the others. If there was another really good talk station, I, I would definitely listen, I'm sure, but that's the one. And the news on, on Radio 4, aside from Eddie Mayer and a couple of the others, is uh, astonishing the way it's um, presented, in that there is no historical continuity in stories. So, for example, uh, if you had um, a, a, a company close down its factory in a certain area and 5,000 people lost their jobs, and I'm making this up as an example, a month or two or three ago, and that was big news, so-and-so has closed down in Sunderland, blah, 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 5,000 jobs have gone. That's a terrible thing. Enter that item. About three months later, the economy has gone through a blah, 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 because there are so many jobs lost, blah, blah, blah. Or not even because there's so many jobs lost. It's like these disparate bits of information without continuity and without any historical context at all. In fact, when the Chilcot report came out a couple of weeks ago and all the yabbering was going on about it, as far as I could tell, the conversation was exactly the same as in 2003, except uh, what was it? 10 million pounds spent on that study, 2.6 million words written just for there to be exactly the same conversation. Now, I don't recall one newsreader saying, exactly as it was said in 2003, this is where we're up to. How interesting. Nothing's changed. No one, no one said that. So there's these bits of it, disparate information and encourages a lack of historical um, perspective. Um, and people seem to have less and less historical context to their, to their facts. Uh, along with this, and I really don't know if this is true or not, but we do know that we, um, we, they have been experimenting with sound technology. For example, um, and I know about sound technology to some extent because I use it myself in my music. I'm, and that's what I work with a lot, is frequencies that have an effect on various organs and part of the body, uh, parts of the body, and it is utterly benign. However, the police said that in the Olympics they were using sound technology to control the crowds for the first time ever. They were using the benign end of the scale, so it wouldn't be like horrible or anything. And as far as we know, it worked, whether it was to do with that or not. There was no trouble in the crowd during that. We can assume, I think, that they wouldn't have just thought, right, well, that was a good thing. Let's put that away in the cupboard and forget about sound technology now. I have a feeling, because I am very sensitive to these things, however, it could be just paranoia, I don't really know, um, that there is stuff happening, because there's feelings of feeling like an imbecile sometimes that don't seem to be just from the phone or just from the sat-nav and so on. There's something like sound waves that are interfering with my prefrontal lobes a little bit. As I say, I haven't got a clue if that's true, but it wouldn't surprise me. There definitely seems to be an encouragement towards imbecility. And I don't mean uneducated even, I mean educated imbeciles, many of them, many of them. And um, th there's a feeling a little bit at the moment for me, forgive me being colorating the, the, the view, that there's a sort of a lemming tendency, a feeling of if the resources are running out, if there is that massive asteroid coming towards us in 2036, as NASA um, says, uh, which is probably unavoidable, are we not just maybe responding to this by becoming more lemming-like? I, I don't really know. On the other side of things, and I would just like to say, contrary to the name of the talk, what is the truth, 
I don't intend anything I say to you to be taken as truth. I'm merely, merely presenting a view. Um, so please understand, I'm not trying to impress you with any truths here at all. What I'm going to give you is a structure for how you can use or gather intelligence that might be different to the one you're using and you might find very useful based on the Taoist uh, template um, in a moment. When I was a much younger man, I went to live with the, one of the Hopi tribes in, um, in uh, New Mexico. I lived with them for four years and that was uh, before they'd been kind of discovered, so shamanism wasn't like on the menu really then, and it wasn't something you could learn in a workshop. It was, you know, you lived in it and, and you kind of got it by being around it. And that's what I was really interested in, how to live in that authentic way in relation to each other and the earth. And I probably would never have come back. It was just that um, I was guided by my inner voice that so I had to come back and share it really. It wasn't a matter of staying up hiding in the mountains forever. It was, I had to come back down. But anyway, on the way there, I happened to meet um, the keeper of the Hopi prophecy, Thomas Banyaka, as he was at the time. Um, it happened by complete coincidence. I was doing Tai Chi on the roof of a motel in Araibi, which is in the middle of Hopi lands in Arizona. Um, it's like being on the moon up there. And um, I, I had read the book of the Hopi. I'd read the Hopi prophecy, which says that at the time, written 2,000, 3,000 years ago, I can't remember. At the time when people would talk to each other through cobwebs in the sky, and at the time when people would stand on a platform in the sky and look back at the Earth, as in you know, the uh, space station, the telephone networks the first, uh, all this stuff that we're experiencing would be happening. And the, the result that they had in the prophecy, I'm not going to actually say it. Um, so I, um, uh, had, uh, I was doing Tai Chi. This guy drives up from miles away, windy road. It was like a movie in a big turquoise drop head, 60s Cadillac, big fuzz of red Afro hair. Gets up on the roof and he goes, hey man, you're doing Tai Chi? And I said, yeah, he said, which was very rare in 1979, anywhere, let alone in the middle of Hopi land. And he did Tai Chi, he was from New York, he was an art dealer, and one of his friends was Thomas Banyaka, the keeper of the Hopi prophecy, he was exactly who I wanted to meet. That's what I'd gone there for, but once I got there, I thought, well, you might as well forget that, because it's really like more that's crazy than looking for a needle in a haystack. Do you want to come for dinner there tonight? Yeah, so there I am. And um, I said, so what I'm concerned about, this is in 1979, is that in Britain, they'd been putting leaflets through the door called Protect and Survive. Um, they tell us to go in the smallest room of the house, uh, block up the gap under the door with clothes, make sure you've got baked beans and water and stuff, and a TV set, because there will be a 72-hour wartime broadcasting uh, countdown on TV. This was Margaret Thatcher's idea, I think, and uh, she is lovely. And um, uh, you, you just had to watch the TV, basically, and they'll count you out, which is <laughs> a really kind of nice idea. And I'm really worried about this, seriously. I mean, you've got all these missiles on one side, all the missiles on the other. And, um, you know, when boys have got guns, they tend to use them. That's kind of how it works. What do you reckon? Is the prophecy going to come true? He goes, no, we must illusion it differently. You must illusion it differently. Because in other words, the whole thing is a trick of the light. The whole thing is a story. I'll get onto that in a moment. And we do, it seems, have the power, if we can focus in enough, especially when we're together, to illusion the story differently. So I only mentioned all the beginning bit because I don't want to be living in an airy-fairy dream. We have to deal with what is. If somebody presents with cancer as a patient, you have to treat that. You can't pretend there isn't cancer there. You work with that. So it's not going to work, just go, oh, it'll be fine. It's nothing. You, know, it doesn't, uh, you, you have to work with what you've got. So that's why I was mentioning the... The symptoms, should we say the symptoms, or some of the symptoms, not even all. Um, and before we can come up with a prognosis and a treatment plan, really, um, he said we can illusion it all away. And I said, oh, come on, man, don't talk, Oop. Don't talk rubbish. Um, you know, when, when it, I can't see how any kind of praying, any kind of meditating is going to change this now. He goes, oh, no, you've become cynical. You must purify yourself. Very important to purify yourself. We can illusion this differently, and we must. And I, I kind of went through a bit of a and came out the other side, all right, seeing that. Within about a week, there was that salt treaty where, I know it was only symbolic, but like about 2,000 missiles on each side were, were uh, dismantled. That was a sign, you know, okay, so it can work. There can, and we haven't had a nuclear war yet. 
So you could say it's kind of worked until now. Um, in other words, we can actually, it seems, apply intentionality to even the global stage. And where I get frustrated, and I think this is why I've been nervous, is this feeling of being so, feeling so impotent. Um, I'm just one guy, and even with the reach I've got, it seems so small. Um, that how do we reach everybody? And I mean, I know that I, I hang out with people who know these people, and I can send little messages, but that's all I can do. Tiny little messages. But even that, I don't know if it's got anything to do with the momentum of things. I haven't really got a clue. Um, but I do see that we can, and there is the possibility, of creating a little movement the other way, which can grow and grow and grow. And that's the best we can do. And one of the uh, aspects, which I'm going to come to at the end again, is this thing of kindness. The, um, it would have been so easy for me to go into a prejudiced, judgmental mode when my friend in Germany was telling me about the refugees. So easy to go, yeah, yeah, well, what do you expect? Blah, 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 whatever people do in those circumstances. And go, oh, it's going to be it's so scary. This is so dangerous. There's, you know, 10 million people that are going to be trying to come in, and I don't blame them, and they're going to be doing, causing all kinds of trouble and blah, 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 blah. What I see as kindness, it shares the root of, uh, with the word kin. And it means taking or, or uh, uh, honoring and accommodating all of humanity as kin. Now, as you know, I mean, you probably know, I certainly do, that your actual family, your blood family, it doesn't mean you're all going to get on with each other just because you're family. Sometimes quite to the contrary. Um, it can be very, very, very difficult getting on with family members. You can really not like them. They can really get on your nerves. They can double-cross you, betray you, do all sorts of horrible things go on. However... There is still, I'd like to think anyway, unless you're completely psychopathic, a feeling of being connected as family, where at the root of it all, you somehow will take care of them. Or the, the, the intention is to accommodate them in your heart rather than block them out. So you may judge them as this or that, but your judgment won't actually get in the way of the true kinship, the kindness in other words. So, when I hear guys in ISIS chopping people's heads off, I want to first chop their heads off. That's what I feel like, because I get angry. And then I go, look, back. this is somebody's son, this is somebody's brother, this is, could be me, it could be me, it could be my own son, it could be anybody, could be drawn into that. I, I'm not here to judge. There is evidently a need for this strangeness to be occurring. People have to play it out. It's a horrible job. I mean, I don't care how much you might go yeah, go into it. I don't think many of those guys enjoy their days out when they do that kind of thing. I don't think the guy in Nice really enjoyed that as a night out. I don't think you possibly could. I think that the horror of being in that space leading up to it and the actual doing of it is so intense that I wouldn't wish that on anybody, that in itself. But that's not even the point. Even though I feel this utter revulsion for acts like that, it really turns me completely upside down. Somehow, I find I can keep this part of me open and embrace that person even, so that I'm not excluding anybody from my family. And I think that that is a key somehow to the healing. That if enough of us can somehow, and I'm not talking about being a pushover, I'm not talking about not holding people to account. What I'm talking about is not going into that vengeful state that wants to punish and exclude. And I don't know how that pans out in reality. I don't know what the actual details are that make that work, because I'm not that clever. But I do know that the template seems to be, if I can just soften my heart, and yeah, I'm, I don't like what you've done there. I don't like what all you've done there, or whatever it is, however, I won't block you from my heart. I still keep my, my love, my kinship with you. This is just what well, I was really saving that for the end, really. But anyhow, so um, the truth. According to the Taoist way of looking at things, there really is no such thing <laughs> um, in the sense that there is no objective truth um, discernible from where we are here. Uh, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, the cosmology of Taoism is there is this phenomenon that can't really be defined or explained, that they call it Tao, which just means the way of everything, the way. And uh, Tao, in its undifferentiated absolute form, um, remains in the subatomic realm. 
And it is what gives rise to the world of matter. So at the subatomic realm, in the subatomic realm, you have this presence, shall we call it, which for some reason or other bursts out of the subatomic realm and becomes all of this. If you needed to um, identify with it a bit more personally, if you look back to when you were conceived um, in the womb, when you were a fetus, you embodied an a priori consciousness and life force as a fetus. Uh, you didn't invent it yourself, as far as I know. It seems that it was there already, and we each embodied it. That is it. That's Tao. If you want to kind of look for proof of the Tao, that, I guess, is as good as you're going to get. Um, this a priori consciousness and energy sits in the subatomic realm in the undifferentiated state. That's where it is. It's just one. There is no polar opposite to it. It is just the one. And it bursts into being, and as soon as it does that, you have two. You have it, and you have what it's burst into being as, this universe. As soon as you have two poles, you have polarity. And the way polarity is described by them is yin and yang. And this is a dance between yin, which is the negative, and yang, which is the positive. It doesn't mean the yin is bad and the yang is good. It just means the two poles in electricity. It's the same. And what happens is, is that the yin the, is a contractive force. It, it draws everything unto itself and congeals. If left to its own devices, it solidifies and becomes useless. Um, when it, and it will do that. It will want to go to the extreme of, of contraction. That's its nature. That's its, its drive. What stops it doing that is the yang, which is the force of expansiveness and heat. So whereas the contraction is cold and dark, the, the yang, the expansiveness, is bright and warm. And the, the yang, the expansiveness, also wants to urge to greater and greater expansion until there is nothing, because it will just dissipate. If left to its own devices, that's what it would do. But it's stopped by the yin. So what happens is, is when things get to their most difficult, their most contracted, their most implausibly impossible to deal with, the seed of the, the opposite is already there. It's already born. So when, for example, you are in a state of utter despair to the point where you're on the floor banging and railing against your maker, how could you forsake me like this, or whatever, you know, what, oh, I can't take anymore. That's the point where grace starts. That's the point where the light is born. And then that grows, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows, and bit by bit, by and by, in the fullness of time, you're riding high. And then you get to a point where you're riding high enough that you start going, wow, this is cool. I've got it now, hey? I've done it. I'm really quite clever, aren't I? I've got it so that it's really working well. At that point, the seed of your disillusion or your, your contraction is already begun at that point, which will then grow and grow and grow. And this cycle of, you know, the, 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 the darkest um, point of the night is when the dawn begins. Um, the sun at midday is the beginning of night. That's when the seed of night is, is born. You can't see it because the sun is so bright. You would never think, well, it's the beginning of nighttime. Um, at midsummer's day, when it's a very beautiful, bright, glorious summer day, you don't start thinking, well, this is the beginning of winter then. You generally don't because you can't see it. But that's the proof of how what is occluded will come through. And that's why I have a feeling that we have a chance, maybe one more time, maybe there a lot more times, I really don't know, that if everything is contracting like it is, if everything is moving into this state of hatred and, and uh, division and, and um, moving into smaller and smaller units that hate the other unit and so on, it will reach its zenith or its nadir rather, and then the, the light will come back, bless you, the light will come back and the, the, the golden age that we've been promised somehow will, will be ours. Um, I don't know, but that's the basis that I'm going on. The encouragement of Thomas Benyaka, the keeper of the Hopi prophecy, the clip of those guys trading in the ruins of the souk in Baghdad with banknotes from a guy who'd already run away, um, seriously trading, that ability to keep things going, and the underlying fact that there is this yin-yang cycle. The question is how big the cycle is. We don't really know. That's what we don't know yet. 
Um, but I'm banking on that one. That's what I'm putting my energy behind. However, because there is this polarity in the world of matter, whatever you see will have its shadow side. Whatever presents itself will have the side that isn't presenting itself. For every bit of matter, there's antimatter. For every truth that you speak, there's a lie underneath it. There has to be. It's just the way it is. So I can present myself, for example, as this fairly fit, um, urbane, uh, fairly sophisticated, fairly erudite man standing here looking fairly together. But I'm not actually saying to you, and behind this T-shirt, this form is crumbling, because it is, isn't it? We don't have to say that. It's obvious, but that's the truth. The way it is, we, we know that the British Empire is a wonderfully grand affair. Buckingham Palace is a very beautiful building. The Mall is a beautiful street. Pall Mall is lovely. All the old gentlemen clubs and gentlemen's clubs. And the grandeur of the British Empire is remarkable. But it also is based on the biggest crime against humanity that ever was. You know, all the slavery. It wouldn't have worked otherwise. That's swept under the carpet, but that is part of it. So the Queen, who is a lovely, was it Paul McCartney called she a lovely old girl? I can't remember. Um, who I really respect. I, I find her wonderful, the way she manages to sum up what was going on uh, with everything with Brexit as uh, we're living in very fast changing times. It's beautiful. It's uh, so succinct and, and delicate. Uh, she's a special woman, I, I have no doubt. But I mean, she's representative of, of, of a clan of um, Essentially, they were the head crooks, weren't they, that, the, the, the royal family, uh, really? Um, Britain got a lot of its wealth, apart from the crime against humanity called slavery, from stealing land and, and the resources in those lands. Um, they weren't the only ones. All the colonial, all the, uh, colonial uh, powers did that. What we also did, which is a little bit cheeky, is that the Spanish, who really work the land, they go in there and really steal the gold from the Incas. You know, they put in the time. We just nicked their gold on the way back when they were sailing back because we had better ships. I mean, what I'm trying to say, I'm not judging it, um, but I do take part of the collective responsibility for it. And um, uh, in other words, the pomp and circumstance, the grandeur, the beauty, the wonderfulness of the, of the royal family and everything that goes with it, there's another side to that. There's another side to absolutely everything. Any truth that you can tell will have a lie underneath it that you can't tell. Um, it is impossible, therefore, to have objective truth. You cannot tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You can merely present one aspect. The only thing that is ultimately true is the Tao. Th that which cannot, the, 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 the truth that can be told is not the real truth. Um, the Tao that can be described is not the real Tao. It cannot be described, it cannot be understood, not with the intellect, but it can be grokked, as Fritz Perls would have put it. You can actually feel it. Um, and I'll explain how in a second. Um, so the idea that there can be any objective truth is something that Tao, oh, forget, remember, I'm not saying this is the truth. Remember that, I'm just presenting you a view. Um, the, the Taoists say that there is no objective truth, only subjective truth. Gregory Bateson, who was, I had the privilege to meet, was Ronnie Lang's mentor. I studied with R.T. Lang, um, and he said that, that you cannot, he was a, a biologist, mathematician, philosopher, you can't know objective truth while you're in the body here. It's not possible. You only get one aspect of it, and we must remember that, because it, it's important. The reason it's important is because we have been imbued with the function of belief. Belief is different from knowing. It's different from knowing. Belief is something else. According to the Taoists, because we live in a transient universe where everything is changing, everything is in transformation, and because that is existentially terrifying, we create the illusion as best we can of permanence. That's why we have so much reverence for the old architecture, for the old customs of the land that we grew up in, and so on. We're trying to create stability out of a totally unstable quantity. <clears throat> so, I <laughs> almost lost it there for a minute. I don't know why, I looked at you and I felt this connection. It made me go, it's a compliment, madam. In fact, I think I will take this opportunity to sip some water while we've still got some to sip on this planet. Um, that was your one hour. That was my one hour. Thank you, Ike. I'll speed it up and get to the, get to the point here. 
Um, so we believe. We, we, we therefore, we rush to believe things before we have all the parameters um, of the experiment clear. Before we've got all the information, we'll, we'll rush to, drum, uh, to draw a conclusion. And we do that through the function of belief. So before I know whether it's a good thing to vote for this or vote for that, I'll kind of, I can't really know all the information. It's not possible. I don't think even the guys involved know all the information. I just have to pin my colors to something. So I'll say, right, I believe that. So I'm jumping to a conclusion. I don't know whether it's true or not. I just I go for that. That is not where a wise scientist would work in doing an experiment. A wise scientist would wait until all the information is in before um, coming to a conclusion. The wise, and this is something that I've learned from Andy, that the, the wise scientist will be quite comfortable not knowing. And I would actually say that not knowing yet. So it's okay to not know the answer to something yet, with the idea that at a certain time you will know the answer, but there's no rush to know it until that time. The difference between knowing and belief is this, that I don't need to believe that if I put my hand in a flame and hold it there, it's going to hurt a lot and burn my hand and make it useless. I don't need to believe that. I know that. That's the difference. Belief is something different. Now, with belief comes stories. And stories are only really possible in terms of maintaining them on a, a mass scale with the function of belief operating. I could give you many examples. Countries, Britain, is, an, is a story. There's no such thing. It's only is. All it is is a bit of land that is not yet under the sea or isn't under the sea at the moment. That's all it is. There's no primordial place called Britain. If this planet gets smashed into and, and blown to pieces by an asteroid, you will not find Britain anywhere in the universe after that. It's a, it's a fabrication. We've made it up. It's a story. It's like a brand. It has a logo, the flag, which is sort of in question a lot of the time because if Scotland leaves and blah, blah, blah. Um, it's got a jingle, which is the anthem, the national anthem, and so on and so forth. It's a story. It's a nice story in many ways, but it is all it is. It's a story. Continents are a story. Europe is a story. America is a story. Um, the religions, if you think about the stories in the religions, and they're completely insane, some of them. I mean, God, who is a man in the sky, um, somehow, who knows everything everybody's thinking all the time and creates everything, he writes this thing on stone before he thought of making books, and it said, among other things, that you shall not cover another man's wife, you shall not commit adultery. 2,000 years later, thinking probably no one was looking, he dives down for some unknown reason to really the wrong end of the Mediterranean, like no one who'd go there, to this little place, finds this girl who's married, makes love with her, and she has a baby. And this guy, um, who, you know, I'm not in any way denying the truth of him, and I as an archetype or whatever it is, is a very important one for me, especially here in Glastonbury, because that sense that possibly there was that him being here is very important to me as well. Um, nonetheless, whatever that all means, because I don't really know, um, he died and then he didn't die. I don't know anybody that's died and didn't die at the same time. But that story um, stuck. Strangely, that story stuck. For an example, I could give you loads and loads of others. No matter how many contradictions there are in that, um, it stuck. And people were uh, cajoled into believing it. And if you didn't believe it and you stood up and said you didn't, you'd be killed for it at certain, long, many times during history. Just like um, Islamists will kill people who are apostates now. Um, for an idea, for a belief, for a story, stories basically rule humanity, or so it seems. And they are only stories, and stories are only upheld through belief. Now, um, this is to do with the way we describe reality to ourselves. Itself, based on so many uh, misconceptions. Uh, for example, this microphone is a thing, right? Would you agree? It's an object I'm holding in my hand. Um, well, it's not. It's a, it's a process. If you looked at this close enough, you'd see it was moving. This thing is changing. It's, it's already surrendering to the force of entropy, but very, very, very slowly. This body is not a thing either. It's a process. It's in the process of surrendering to entropy. And so is this stage, and so is everything else. 
Everything we can see, there are no, even though I said thing, there are no actually, there are no objects. Everything is a process. Everything is moving. There's one little story for a start. Another one is that, you know, I live in Ibiza a lot of the time, and it's a big thing there to go and look at the sunset. And you wouldn't think anything strange about that, would you? But it's nonsense. There is no sunset. There is no sunrise. It's an earth spin. And we know that now. We, I know there are people who think the earth actually is flat again, but let's assume that we can stick with the original, you know, what we found out more recently, that, that, that it is round. Um, it, the earth is spinning. Um, and, and, and there is no sunset and sunrise. That comes from really still believing that the earth is flat, the fact that we will subscribe to that sunrise, sunset thing. I know you'll say it's just words, but words are important in the sense of, uh, the language we use is how we keep the story together. For example, the mythical present, as I call it. Um, I could tell you, without, I think, without you thinking I was too crazy, that on Fridays, for example, I really like to eat fish. Uh, on Saturdays, I like to go to town and go shopping. And on Sundays, I like hanging out at home and resting. I mean, that's not exactly what I do on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but it's a fairly kind of classic example, isn't it? And there's nothing about that that you could say, well, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? I mean, it seems quite normal. But really, where is this Friday that I am doing this thing on? Where is this Saturday that I'm going to the show? Where is this Sunday that I'm talking about? Actually, what's happening is I'm standing here right now, and if I was being really precise, I'd say, up until now, what I've been doing is Friday's generally that, Saturday's that, Sunday's that. And I could say, and I intend to keep doing that in the future. However, if I just say, I like doing so-and-so, I like eating Italian food, I like driving a nice car, whatever, that's suggesting that I'm continuing that picture. And everyone who I talk to that goes, yeah, me too, I like doing that, and they're upholding that picture. And this is an example of how we collectively hold the myth in place. So that's what we do in Britain, we do this. Well, what do you mean we do? We've done it, and we may do it in future, but we can't say we do it, because what we do is this right now. That's what we're doing. So, for example, we create a mythical reality, and we're not even aware we're doing it, are we? It's completely unconscious. It's like we're in water, and we don't realize it, because we're in water. We're in the air, we don't realize it, because we're in the air. We, we create this myth, and we don't realize it, because we're in the myth, but it's, all it is is one version of what's going on. So you might think, well, what's the point then? What have you got to tell us here, Barefoot Dotson? And it's this, that by, um, there is another way, and you know it's called gnosis, um, or omniscience, if you like. And it's the subconscious mind that knows absolutely everything, without exception. It knows everything that's ever happened since the Big Bang and before. It knows everything that's going to happen hereafter throughout the universe, and it knows everything that's happening right now, without exception. So without knowing it right now, you are calculating the fluctuation between the, in the gravitational pull between Saturn and Jupiter. You don't know that because it would be too much for you to entertain in your conscious mind. But the subconscious knows absolutely everything. Look, again, this is not meant to be the truth. This is just me presenting the Taoist view or my interpretation of it. Um, I could give you an example, a very, very crude one. If I go like this. Now, I, I didn't think about that, and it wasn't a great piece of drumming, I confess. But, um, I, I mean, I can drum, but I could never have consciously counted the amount of beats to the bar that were in that, and that wasn't really that complex. I, I could only do that because my subconscious can count that fast, and that is nothing. I mean, that's nothing. What our subconsciouses can do is way beyond that. They're like the biggest supercomputer ever. I mean, if you want to know about what God is, that's the subconscious mind, the all-knowing. The conscious mind, which is a, a relatively much later um, development that in the prefrontal lobes, um, is what modern psychologists call the self-conscious mind. And it's in there that we generate our descriptions of reality, at first aided by parents and teachers, TV, media, books, and what have you. We, we create a story about the world. And um, it is only a story. I mean, the correlates in it will probably be fairly important and, 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 and accurate, uh, 
fire burns, ice freezes and you know heights don't fall off them, don't run in front of cars and all the rest of it. Um, but it is a story. We, we generate a story, a description of reality. And we also um, evaluate our position in relation to that story, as in how well am I doing in this story? Am I likely to fall over here or am I likely to succeed? We also um, do that in the prefrontal lobes. And that is based on entirely spurious subjective criteria, um, usually in comparison to other people whose image is of great success or great beauty or great wealth or whatever, because everybody puts on a show, everyone puts on their best face, um, but we don't know what's going on behind the scenes there, so we could really be comparing ourselves to somebody and think, oh, I'm rubbish, I'm no good at this, I'm not good enough, da, 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 compared to that guy, not knowing that that guy is completely messed up and has all sorts of problems going on. So it's spurious and subjective, the way that we judge our, our position in life. And that is the basis of our internal dialogue. What all this is about, where it's going to go, how well am I doing in it, and what are my chances of survival? What are my chances of thriving on all of this? That whole thing goes on in the forebrain. Some of it will bear relation to what's actually happening, but only by coincidence. So what the Taoists say, and then not only that, but there is this uh, a loop as well. So if I can manufacture a, a film, in my, a story in my head about the world, and um, that's all I'm going to be able to do, is just create a story about it. And I was doing it before. It's fairly well informed, I suppose, but I wouldn't really know. I will then create uh, or, or generate feelings in my belly about that story, and vice versa. When I get the fear in my belly from being an animal on the planet, and I don't address the fear and go, oh, yeah, that's fear, relax, it's good to be afraid, I'm an animal, that's fine. When I forget about that, that heat from the fear goes up into my forebrain and stimulates that movie-making um, faculty. So I create a loop of um, a picture in the head and then feelings about that picture and, and vice versa. That's quite noisy. That's quite a lot of activity. That's going on in the front of us pretty much all the time. So you're walking around and you're thinking, oh, God, what if I could do tomorrow? Oh, sure, I haven't got any money. I need to get some money. What happens if I go broke? Oh, it would be really awful. Everyone thinks I'm an idiot. Going to end up in the gutter. No, 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 you won't end up there. No, it'll be this. Remember what you learned in your spiritual classes. You know, like manifest more. And it'll be like, is it working? I don't know if it's working. Maybe I'm rubbish. And all that nonsense that goes on, all goes on in the front of the brain and the body, that tension that you get there. And that's the drama of being the person. That's the constructed self, if you like. That isn't who we are, though. That's just a version. It's a, a fictitious being that we have invented ourselves. It, if you don't believe me, think of your signature, which is the most natural thing, isn't it? Sign here, brrr, you sign. You don't think about it, do you? But cast your mind back to when you first started developing your signature. I mean, I remember mine. It went backwards, then it went up, and then it went forwards. And I spent ages getting it to like, bang, that's the one. I love that. And I could do it really quickly. I, I don't think about that now. That's just my signature. Well, it's fake, isn't it? I mean, I've developed that. It's not natural like it looks. Nor is anything else we do. It's all an act. It's all something we've developed, part of our repertoire. Um, the, the possibility of finding peace of mind when caught up in all of that is very, very limited. And the danger is, is that we do get caught up in the front of our bodies for one reason, is that our sense organs face forwards. And therefore, we perceive the world going on in front of us. And because the world is exciting and it's got moving shapes and colors and light and all the rest of it, it draws us forward. Same way as when you look at a TV on in a room. You'll just look at the TV. You can't help it because it's moving and within a frame. And it's the same. We get drawn forwards to try and get a closer handle on it all. And we forget to drop back again to occupy where we really should be sitting, which is in the back of us. And the reason this is so important, uh, the front part of you is this noisy environment, quite vulnerable, it's not well protected, it's got the breastbone, pubic bone, otherwise all this is wide open here and, um, and quite vulnerable, therefore insecure and noisy as I say. The back part of you um, is quiet, relatively speaking, um, it's strong, much stronger than the front, and the spine itself is the main solid structure in your body. You can't get a lot more invulnerable and solid than the spine when it comes to being a human being. 
And the only place that's fairly vulnerable is your kidneys in the back of the neck. But otherwise, you're pretty safe in the back. And as I say, it's quiet and it's strong and it's silent. When you occupy your back, which is what we were doing when we were in the womb, and what you do, say, when you're dancing and you're really let go, or when you're singing and you're really let go, or meditating or praying or chanting, or anything where you come out of the drama, anything where you've somehow or other got come out of the noise, you will find you're in your back. The martial artists use this, that's how I know it, because you learn to punch from the back, because that way you've got your body weight behind it. If you punch this from the front, you need very strong arms to prevail. So the idea is you bring your whole body weight into it by moving from the back. The other advantage is that when being attacked by an assailant, you don't have the fear about your face or whatever being hurt because it's not really your face anymore, it's just a face. Um, and though there will be fear, and I've experienced it, fear does come up, you're not afraid, there is just fear. Ah, oh, how interesting, there's fear. But it doesn't prevent effective ac action. The other aspects of the back, and this is even more important, is that we talk about the, well, I talk about the background presence, and synonymously with the, the presence that's at the subatomic level, that which sits behind everything that's manifest, the Tao, if you want to call it that. Um, we talk about the witness bearer, that, that aspect of consciousness that bears witness that when you're born, going through the birth canal, when you start school, and, uh, when, you, um, when you get married, when you get divorced, when you get ill, when somebody dies, anything that you go through, everything you go through, in fact, it's there watching, bearing witness from the back of you. That's where you bear witness from. The best spot in this room to see the whole room is the back of the room. Um, from there, you can see the whole, the whole show. Clearly, you see over everyone's head, you can see what's occurring in the room. So what they say is, if you can draw yourself into your back and stay there as much of the time as possible, you will feel very uh, secure, solid, silent, strong, invulnerable, and, um, and clear of the noise that goes on in the front. You will no longer be the drama. You'll just be presence, pure presence. That is where the subconscious mind exists, if you like. The, um, the, the front part then becomes this interesting phenomenon occurring in the front of you. So rather than being scared that you're not going to have any money, rather than dealing with all your internal dialogue, or as well as, rather than being lost in it, however, you're behind it accommodating it. So you're like the emperor or the empress, sitting back in the throne at the back of the palace, accommodating the entertainment, whether it's a horror movie or a fun movie, going on in the front of you. Try it now. Um, if you could close your eyes and just let your body soften a little bit. I mean, you don't have to shuffle about. You can, you can just stay where you are. The, just as long as you feel relatively comfortable. Um, let your breathing relax so that you're breathing fairly slowly. And you can feel the rise of the belly on the in-breath and the fall of the belly on the out-breath. Uh, become aware of where you might be holding tension, back of the neck, the face, the, the buttocks, for example, forearms, all those sorts of places. Just soften everywhere. Let go of anywhere that you know that you're, you're clinging for no reason. Um, let the spine elongate somewhat, as if someone is raising the crown of your head towards the ceiling. So you just get a bit more length in the spinal column. Note how that makes you feel a bit brighter altogether. Um, let the shoulders drop and let the shoulder girdle broaden. Let the pelvic girdle broaden so that you feel that you're slightly broader, slightly taller. Let the breastbone slide upwards and outwards a bit, like a, a queen or a king, sort of with a big round chest, that kind of a big open chest, that the breastbone sort of wants to go diagonally upwards towards the ceiling a little bit. And um, in this state, picture... This is just a, a trick, a visualization trick to get your mind back there. That you're breathing in through all the pores of the front of your body, all the pores of the skin in the front of your body and face simultaneously. And you're breathing in bright white light. So it's like a wall of white light as you breathe in, coming in through all the pores of the skin and collecting in the back of you, everywhere rear of your side seams. Then as you breathe out, likewise, you're pushing that wall of white light out through the front of your body, and somehow that forward thrust of the light pushes you further back inside, 
in your back, like when you're taking off in a plane and the acceleration thrusts you backwards. So as you breathe in, you're drawing this white light into the back, which lights it up and makes it like a nice place to be. So you kind of let yourself sink into it. As you breathe out, you push the white light out of you in the front, and that movement pushes you even further back inside until it feels like you've reoccupied your rightful territory, which is the back of you. So you've actually doubled your depth by doing this. In the front, all you've got is the front. When you're in the back, you've got the back and the front. And keep on letting yourself slide back further and further inside, allowing your mind to sit in the rear of the skull, like a Buddha with your face on, leaning up against the rear wall of a cave, which is the back wall of the skull. Very comfortable on a pile of cushions, gazing through the, the, the middle of your forehead into infinity, just because there's nothing else to gaze at. So you're in the back of your brain and you're gazing into infinity. Your presence, your physicality is gathered in the back of you, so you're nice and solid. You'll note straight away that with the mind in the rear of the brain, there's no thinking in the front. Just for this moment, you might notice that the noise of the internal dialogue has stopped, which is what you aim for when you meditate to stop thinking. Well, this is how it's done, by coming back behind all the thinking. Now comes the heart. I mean, I'm racing through this a little. Now, now comes the heart, the area of the chest. Um, if you visualize that up there in the front of you, where the breastbone is, it kind of opens like two sliding doors opening to reveal the essence of you, the beauty of you, the gorgeousness of you, that which when you were born as a newborn baby and your mother and father picked you up and they went, oh God, he's so beautiful, she's so beautiful. That that you inspired is still who you are. So that beauty in your soul, that's what the heart represents. Now imagine that the breastbone has opened up like a pair of sliding doors to reveal this beautiful effusion of rose gold light, smelling amazing like otherworldly fragrance. Um, as if it's being fueled by some cluster of precious jewels that are lit from within. And this warmth, this radiance from there is healing. It's the essence of you, it's the beauty of you that you've shielded and blocked because of being betrayed and disappointed over the years and so on. But now allow to let it flow freely. And this is the connective tissue that connects you to all humanity. And even the people who are engaged in evil activities at this moment, even they have this part of them. Beneath all of that distortion, even they have this. The majority of people on this planet, of course, are living in peace and harmony with each other. This is something that's not usually um, spoken about. Um, tuning in to the beauty in eight billion people right now from the heart, just being available to it, and allowing them to be available to your effusion of, of beauty that's coming from you. None of this done with any great righteousness or effort. It's just natural. This is, this is kinship. This is kindness. And all of this is done from the back of you. You're right behind all of that, sitting right back. And as you sit back, become aware that the skin in your back is not the solid covering or separator that we imagine it to be. That there is no real barrier between you and everything behind you. And allow yourself to keep sinking backwards and backwards and backwards inside, as if you're bursting out the back of your body. You notice as you do this, just flying backwards really, that you're becoming bigger as you go backwards, and you're going backwards faster the further you go, and the further and faster you go, the bigger you're getting. As if what you're doing is growing into your full size which is as big as the whole universe, bigger even than the whole universe, and at the same time, smaller than the tiniest subatomic particle imaginable. So this is Tao, this is the Tao. And you're just sinking back into it, and into it, and into it, and into it, and into it, until you feel as if you're being held from behind by a pair of loving maternal arms. Of course, this is just a figurative visualization. The sense that you're held by the loving arms of the great mother herself. Because they say, if you're going to have to anthropomorphize the Tao, at least call it mother. So that in the sense of in the bosom of the Tao, where whence all providence derives, whence all succor, sustenance, and safety, everything that we 
require from the world actually derives from this, from the big mother, the big mama behind. And here you are sitting back into her bosom, totally comfortable, totally safe, the heart open in the front because you can afford to be open now, and everything else completely and utterly, utterly relaxed. Now, the conscious mind that makes sense of everything, that describes everything, the filters of perception that that provides is what colorates your experience. So if you want to expand or broaden the parameters so that what you're perceiving is a much greater span of the spectrum and thereby gain more what we call psychic power because you're just seeing more of the light and the sound, all you have to do is relax your temples. Imagine that your temples are broadening like a pair of flaps that are opening up to the sides. And it's that simple movement of broadening the temples actually, over time, if practiced a little every day, broadens your perception. So your filters of perception widen by relaxing the forehead and allowing it to broaden. But you're all the way back in the back of the brain there observing. You're connected to your brethren and sisters through your heart, so you're not cut off. You're receiving your family at a soul level your giving of your true essence, your beauty, your kindness, beyond thinking through the open heart. The weight of the body is sunk down in the belly and the hips to give you gravitas, so you're not floating with this. And you're way back in the back of you, in touch with the source of all reality. That is the basic template for the transcendent state, according to the Taoist tradition, whence the truth is known. In a, in a Gnostic sense, you actually have Gnosis, you have omniscience in, in this mode. And if anything is required as information, all you have to do is go quiet, go into the back and say, reveal to me what I need to know about this or that or whatever it is. And within a very short space of time, the answer will come through quietly and insistently um, in the center of the brain approximately, up the upper brain stem like a, an, an email and pops into the midbrain which you can then read or see from the, the rear brain. Um, and on that note, um, I would like you to slowly open your eyes and contemplate uh, where are we going from here? What are we going to use our intention for? Um, as I say, we have to be courageous and acknowledge that we really don't know what our chances of survival are right now. I think if we were aliens looking down at the planet, which I'm sure there are many doing so, you'd probably be thinking, whoa, oof, I don't know about that one. Um, but as I say, we really don't know. So what we have got is the facility for spreading kindness in any way that occurs. It doesn't have to be anything specific, but any time that there's an acknowledgement of eye contact between me and another person, and there's respect from my heart to that person just for their being, no matter how messed up they might appear to be, Something happens that's healing there. Um, if I walk down the street and I'm feeling a bit low, I'll suddenly sometimes just get a lift. And I'm sure that's somebody sending me a blessing. I do it for people a lot. When I walk down the street or I'm driving, I see somebody who looks in pain or, or whatever, I'll send light to them. I'll send them a blessing. I visualize them lifting up and looking beautiful and happy. And, and I'm convinced that this has a, an actual effect. So I think we must not must, but I think it's probably a good thing to, every time, I'm certainly going to do it myself, every time you catch yourself worrying, being concerned about the world, which will happen after every lurch of the news usually, um, to remember that the majority of people on the planet are living harmoniously with each other. The majority of people at this point in time are still not actually killing each other, hitting each other, hurting each other in any way at all. Um, th th these stories that break the news um, are noisy. When you fire a gun, it makes a noise. One person doing a horrible thing makes a lot more noise than a million people doing a very kind thing, because it doesn't make a noise doing a kind thing. But it doesn't mean it's not as strong. In fact, I believe it's stronger. I believe, I feel it's stronger. And so that is my ultimate message of this talk, is to, if anything, to be positive, it's that. It's just to keep this heart open from the back of us, to receive all of humanity in this love, not to cast anyone out. It doesn't mean overlook the things you don't like. Acknowledge them, but nonetheless, they're your family, and therefore are not to be cast out. And in that embracing 
I feel will come the chance of healing, which is what's required so desperately now. How does that sound? All right. Um, no, thank you. And my mum would be so proud of me. Thank you, really, thank you. My mum would be so proud because I hardly even hinted at a swear word, which I am more impressed about than anything else. So this is the, the question and answer time because I really said all that to inspire a conversation. It wasn't meant to be a polemic. Um, and I know at first people get a bit shy and you don't really want to interact, but I would so love it if we could have a, a conversation here because I want to hear what your ideas about that are and, and let's just ask me questions and so on. Now, before we do that, we're just going to do a little dance of microphones. So now, Stephen is going to hand me his microphone. I'm going to hand Sheila that microphone. And Stephen will take the blue one. And now we can roam with microphones. And please, who would like to ask a question? We could raise the lights up a little bit. That would be lovely. Thank you. Do we have any questions out there? Yes, we do. Who's... I'm going to get to her first. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Hiya. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just really interested in something you said at the start, and you still might, might, might be the same response, but the Hopi prophecy, you said, oh, I'm not going to say what it said. Why, why not? Uh, is this on? Because this um, it's too horrible. <laughs> it's just horrible, and I don't really want to say it. <laughs> you can find it out for yourself if you want to. Uh, just to say the image, put the image in the room, is not necessary, I feel, at this time. Yeah. Would you mind if I didn't? I just feel that... Well, the, the You'll have to look them up, I guess. Yeah, yeah. The Hopi, the Hopi were very interesting. They were originated from Tibet, and uh, they got to the central part of the United States, of Americas, rather, about 25,000 years ago, probably through po from Polynesia. Um, they came by boat, apparently. That's at least one theory. And uh, they, interestingly, while I was there, Grandfather David, who was then the, the, the elder, main elder, what they called, um, received the Dalai Lama, came for a visit. And they discovered that the Hopi word for sun is the same as the Tibetan word for moon and vice versa, because they're an antipodes to each other. So the, the Bun tradition of Tibet, which predates Buddhism, um, is very, very similar in its dances and the shamanistic style of, of uh, communicating with the so-called underworld. Uh, the Hopi wear kachina masks and they do similar dances. And they were gifted and are gifted with prescience. And there was this prophecy that was really remarkable. And I would recommend having a look at it. But it's interesting. Mm. Let's have another question. Be bold. Come on. There's people out there. You must have some thoughts. Oh, dear. Right. Well, I'm going to ask a question then. Tell us a little bit more about your music and the frequencies. I'm very interested to hear more about what you're doing with that. Um, thank you. Well, the, uh, the project that I've just completed my part of, which is the actual finishing of all the... the, the it's a 69-minute cycle of... Um, a hypnotherapy, advanced hypnotherapy on the dance floor. The reason I'm interested in dance floors is because if you get it going, the celebration that occurs is beautiful. And it's, if you get it right, and it doesn't happen every time, it's the feeling that everybody has a, this is what life's all about, not all the other nonsense. It's this, this just being together, celebrating being alive, that, where the love really is palpable. So that's what interests me. And the script is a, a, a hypnotherapeutic script that I've developed a style of over the decades. Honed in Ibiza doing two club nights a week for a few years, um, and elsewhere as well. Uh, to people that weren't speaking English mostly, so it's quite interesting. You know, you had to develop a repetitive style of saying something kind of simple often before it hooks in. And saying it like a sample on a track, really. So um, I've got interesting voice techniques. I, this thing took me 6,000 hours plus to, to, to make. It's really complex. I'm using 111 frequency and 432 mostly, um, which uh, do have a certain effect on the, on, on the body. Um, it was the Nazis who introduced 440 hertz, um, which is, uh, it was done apparently specifically to make everyone go a bit wonky, and it's never really been changed back. Um, uh, but there are lots of people now experimenting with these true frequencies that came before they did that. 
And the difference is really palpable. So there's like layers of frequencies going on. Not obvious, because it's dance track, so you, you, you don't want it too obvious. I'm using binaural beats, but again, they're embedded, so you can't actually hear them, uh, obviously, unless you're clued in. Uh, and I'm using what I call polyliminals, which is, uh, if I say you're beautiful, it's okay to know you're beautiful. That, I didn't say that anywhere in it as it happens, but if I had said that, um, th at that point, it's okay to know you're beautiful. We'll start bouncing from side to side, um, under, just under the surface. You could just hear it, maybe, but not, nothing more than that. And then the next positive statement that I'll say on the top line, we'll do likewise, until by the end of the tune, you've got about 20 messages bouncing in an interesting um, sequence, all rhythmically. Under the, so occasionally I let them be seen, like you know, showing yourself naked for a moment, uh, where you hear this really interesting going under the surface. And, um, the overall effect, it's also got a lot of soul. It's, I mean, I'm a musician. My, my cousin was Stan Getz. My dad was a, a great jazz drummer. My uncle was a great musician. I come from a musical family, so I, I can create a, a bit of soul in my, in my tracks as well. And it's like, oh, I would call it elderly people's house music, just because it's, it's got a lot of musicality to it. I'd love to achieve the simplicity of the young guys. Uh, young people. I, I don't know quite how they do it. It's just very basic, but it works really well. But my feeling is, is that I can add some depth and warmth and humor and, and, and musicality to the, um, the, the mix that might not have been there already. And it's called DARE, Digital Audio Reboot Experience. So it's not called Barefoot Dots or anything. And um, at the moment, I have one of the top guys on the planet doing the finalizing, because I couldn't do it myself, because you lose perspective when you get to the end. And, um, and he's going to be ready in August, sometime August. And then there are a couple of record companies I'm talking to, and probably will be more, and I don't know who it's going to go through. But all being well, if it's irresistible enough, which is the idea, after 6,000 bloody hours, um, somebody's going to go, yeah, we've got to have that. And, and, that, and there's, there are other projects as well. There are quite a few others. But that's my main, my main focus at the moment. It's one way of bringing some peace to the world, because the frequencies do. I was playing it to my friend who I came, with, Jemima, who I came here with uh, on the way, and she said it really changed her state of mind uh, on the way here. It does, it lifts you, it does something physically to your, to your brain waves, I think. I don't know what else to tell you about it. Okay, very good. Now, was, yeah, was we, do have, we do have a question. Here we go. Thank you, Arch, for a very enlivened uh, talk. Um, the phrase post-truth politics has been used, uh, and certainly you mentioned about the disinformation of the media, um, they're getting in the way, they're creating the story more than they are reporting the story. Uh, how can we get the dialogue between decision makers and the people to actually have a more sensible debate about the truth as opposed to the created stories which sort of excite us and get us entrained in all sorts of wrong ways of living and being? Are you asking me how we can get this to happen? Just your thoughts on that, yeah, thanks. Uh, I have many thoughts on it, and I, I, I would love for us to be able to do that. I'm always actually quite astonished at the, the level of debate um, among people who are generally so intelligent can get to such a stupid low level uh, of slogan shouting. And that goes along with that sort of uh, goldfish bowl, uh, the, the goldfish memory of the two-second memory that people seem to have now. You can do slogans, and you don't have to come up with any rationale. Eventually, even my mum will go, do you think maybe... Blah, 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 because she's heard it said enough times like that. Um, I say even mum, because she's a really intelligent woman, you know. Uh, I don't know what the answer to is, but I do feel that the, if we, collectively talking as people who are awake with good hearts, stay firm in our uh, intention to contribute sanity, shall we say, and wisdom to the mix. If we stay firm with that, somehow or other, I do feel that our time will come where we somehow are influencing how that conversation occurs. Because it surely can only go, well, maybe it can carry on getting even more stupid, I don't know. But it can't go that, I mean, things swing, don't they? So when everything gets too rigid, it starts to get supple on another, uh, in another area, and I think that's what will happen. You asking me the question just made me feel immediately that we will, we will prevail. We will have the chance to have intelligent conversation because it can't carry on at this absurd level for much longer, can it? It's just it's stupid, it's boring, apart from anything else. <laughs> Thank you. We have another question over there. Sheila, are you over there? Yep, there I'm go. coming round. 
This is really fun. Thank you for playing. Um, how are you going to let us know when this recording is available and we can all purchase it? She's asking when will, you, when will your recordings be available and how will they know where and when to purchase it? That is a lovely question. That, you're not a plant, are you? Um, <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, thank you for asking. Um, I actually don't know is the answer to that. Once it's finished and then I do the rounds of the... Uh, well, I follow the, the magical uh, road to... Uh, I, I'm, I'm imagining that people will just know about it. And I'll probably promote it like the tart that I am from my site as something by some people that I've been working with. <laughs> um, uh, and I will, yeah, you know, I'll let it be known from my own website. My site is barefoot.toglobal.com, by the way. Um, and it's a great site. I, I have a mailing list if you want to... Can I, I write great emails about one a week or so. Uh, just about, the, I say great, I mean, that's what people tell me. And um, I, I do online trainings in, of some depth of all the stuff that I was going on about today, qigong, uh, meditation, um, healing, all sorts of things, filmed. I've did, just done and finished doing an anti-anxiety training because there are a lot of people, 18 to 24 group around the world who are just de deeply, deeply anxious, a sort of performance anxiety because of the the Instagram effect, where they're looking at images of people looking great and wonderful all the time. People feel, really, that they might not have what it takes to compete. And the competition is increasing all the time. So there's a lot of anxiety. I wanted to do a training, this, for example, for, for young people. Um, uh, and that's what I've just, I do a lot of that. So it's a good, it's good, it's good, it's good. I like it. I've put a lot of energy into that site. That's one of my main kind of work. That's the serious work in my life. So probably I'll let it, uh, you'll know, if it's any good and it goes, you'll hear it, dare, just look out for dare. I, I hope, who knows, who knows. We have another one. Yeah, the, um, the, the wonderful uh, way of peace taught by O Sensi um, and brought Aikido to, to all of us. I wondered if you had any more uh, tales of your teacher in your early days of Aikido? Um, I, I love, you know what, it's from here, it's very hard to hear the questions unless it's just my ears. Um, yeah, sure, I just, I, <laughs> I'm shouting at you now. I wondered if you'd tell us a little bit more about your early experiences of Aikido. Um, I can tell you one thing though, <laughs> I remember right now. So there was this, uh, a lord, <laughs> a lord, and a lord. I mean, I'm only saying that because I think it's funny. Um, that's the only time I've ever been around so many lords. And um, the idea was, is that I'm 11, right? And they're quite big guys. And um, the, the, the deal was, is that they're coming at you. And you go, uh, as I recall, you, you strike out to the, to the testicles and then straight up to the, under the chin. So you hit the two guys either side of you and straight up to the guy in the middle. And you've got rid of the, the three guys who are coming at you. So it was all fine when I was that guy, but then I, t I had to be one of the guys, and they were hitting low to avoid contact with the, with the private parts, because that would really hurt, because I was small. I was only 11. I remember at that point, whack, like, woof, like that. And it was an amazing feeling of shock, because I'd never been hit that hard by uh, a full-grown male in that part of my body, if ever, I don't think I'd ever been hit there before, actually. And I, I just, it was unbelievable. So the teacher, the, the master, came and put his hand over this, just around there, just above there, and just went like that, very slowly pulled like that, the, the, the chi, the key away. And by the time he got to there, it was completely gone. There was no, you know, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been hit there, but it's like, whoa, the ache is unbelievable. It's just gone within milliseconds. That's one story. Um, I can't really think of any others offhand. Um, I do remember, though, that I'd go in there. It was in Harley Street. I only got the, the Harley Street connection as an adult about five, six, seven years ago. Realized that that's, he was in Harley Street because he was a healer. I never really connected that bit. I just used to go, you know, when you're a kid, you just go somewhere, right? So I come out of there, like, being taught all this peacefulness and this centeredness and everything. Think, right, come on, somebody start on me. Come on, let's try this thing out. Fortunately, nobody, nobody ever did. Uh, I have many more stories, but I can't remember many more about him. Um, I, 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 Hugh Cordor was the patron. He's a very beautiful looking man. 
Um, and it was always, Lord Cordor, you come tomorrow. Lord Cordor, you come tomorrow. I said, everyone had to be really on their best behavior because Lord Cordor was coming. And um, uh, I only have actually saw him walk past for a moment once. That was my own connection with him. But it had a really strong effect on me. Really, he's something about him. He's really loved, beautiful looking guy. Very special because I guess a sort of some aristocrat from a castle in Scotland to go to Japan, meet this guy and bring him over. He really was in 1964 or something. That was quite advanced, really. And um, I have some friends who live up in near Inverness and went there for Christmas a few years ago, about three, four years ago. And um, but prior to this, when I was a kid, he, every time he said to me, Lord God, oh, you come tomorrow, that I used to have this uh, picture of a beautiful, beautiful forest on a hill um, with lichens, or whatever you said, I know, lichens, is it? Uh, hanging. And, and it was an, a particular kind of forest, and it was the ultimate forest. And I've moved all around the world, and I've been to forests in beautiful places, and every forest I've ever been to, wherever it is, I go, oh, this is beautiful, but it, it's not the one, man. This isn't the real thing. I, this is what the th anyway, I get taken to Cordor House because his w widow wanted to meet me. And um, w in the for it was the forest. It was the one that I'd seen. It was exactly where I'd seen. It was truly unbelievable. And when I went into the house, there were photographs of him, and I know I just stood gazing at I felt this real connection, thinking... Was I him? Was, no, I couldn't. No, I wasn't have been him. It was past life, this place. I know this place. So I don't know what it is at all. But it was some very, very deep connection um, with that Lord God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have a question here. Um, I was rather intrigued by a book title, uh, which I saw a few years ago. And um, seen as the program Top Gear, uh, without a presenter, I was wondering exactly how far you can drive with your eyes closed, and can we all do it? <laughs> yeah, no, this is definitely not something to try at home. So, <laughs> well, the, the title of that book was because one of the little vignettes, <coughs> excuse me, in the book was um, about a teacher I had in, in New Mexico called Govinda, I think. And um, he was a beautiful guy with long blonde hair, very straight blonde hair, tied in a ponytail, who would drive from Santa Fe up to Taos uh, once a week to teach me polarity. That's what he was teaching. Uh, it was like one of the things that I was learning aside from the Chinese medicine and so on. And one time he arrived. Now, this guy really was not a, uh, a liar. I mean, he so wasn't the kind of guy that would tell stories or fibs or uh, make up. I don't, unless I'm really naive, it would have been ridiculous that he would have been. Uh, he, he'd been tired, he'd been working hard, and he arrived. Uh, the road from Santa Fe to house is really windy, bendy up the Rio Grande, and it's, it's not one you'd want to drive sleeping. Um, and he drove, he said, the last hour of it with his eyes closed because he was very, very tired and he needed to sleep. Now, he did have that power. I, I'd seen his psychic power. He could see through his forehead really clearly. We tried it out enough times. He demonstrates it. He closed his eyes and get me to do things, and he told me what I was doing. Yeah. Um, so even though the part, my rational mind, oh, shut up, you didn't really drive. No one could do that. But I thought, you know, he's not lying. I bet he did. He probably really did. Um, that was why the book was called that. Um, but I uh, had an experience myself of, I used to be in the crew of the Whirly Gig, which is the original psychedelic trance club in, in London. And we used to have a crew party with about 50 strong crew twice a year, often at a Palmerston fort on Plymouth Sound, um, which had been converted into a conference centre. And we used to make a five-day mad party there. You could imagine it was completely over-the-top hedonism, and it was really, really fun. So after five days of pretty much no sleep and a lot of altered states, um, I was driving my friend Frank and I back along the M4, and I fell asleep in the fast lane. And I, in the sleep, it was a lucid sleep, because I learned to do lucid sleeping or dreaming. I, I remembered, look through your forehead, do what he did, Govinda, just look through the forehead. And I, I did, I, I could see the road through my forehead. And um, I, I opened my eyes eventually. Frank was completely awake watching me doing it, wasn't scared at all. And I hadn't veered, because I saw what I was doing, I hadn't veered at all off the, off the lane. I would really hate to be in that position again, and I so wouldn't recommend it. But if ever you do fall asleep on a motorway, look through your forehead, and it will wake you up anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We have a gentleman here. Okay. Sheila's, Sheila's on her way. We'd best make this the last question, by the way, so make it a good answer. A lot of people... Can you hear me? Um, 
A lot of people uh, don't watch the news because it's so negative. Would it serve humanity better to watch the news but send love to those people who have been, you know, in distraught, or even better, to the dictators who are creating the mess? Would that be more a service rather than not watching any news at all or because it's negative? Well, well I mean, I can only talk from my own preference. Uh, I, would, I can't speak for anybody else and say what would be better. It's what suits each individual. I, I would, though, personally advise not watching TV news because that is so such heavy programming, literally. Um, uh, and, and the bias is so powerful. It's very hard to not be completely... And I goodness knows what else they put in the screen there. And I'm sure there's stuff going on. I know there's stuff. I'm not sure. I know there's stuff that goes... Subliminal stuff. I don't know what they're putting on, but... Um, I mean, personally, I get my news from a bizarre assortment of places, primarily from Russia Today website, rt.com. I know the bias. It's really obvious and it's really clear. That's the point. I know where the bias is. I find the bias harder to detect in some other um, news sources. But that's my, my main one, because I know how to gauge the bias. And I also find the... the the subtext that they're spinning really fascinating because they're very, very clever. They appeal to the kind of the young person's mind with a sort of a, a faux anarchistic bent to it. It's very, very clever, and I just find that fascinating. But they also give you an amazingly good roundup of the world news. Then there's Reuters, and I could just give you a whole list of other ones. But just to, um, that, it, we each have our own preferences, but I think not dwelling on it too much, just checking headlines so that you can keep a track on all the various stories. Um, which the British news tends to be a bit parochial about. It picks things up and drops them. There's very little continuity. Plus, it's very uh, Britain-centric, astonishing. So it really is like a, a local news station compared to uh, some of these others. So that would be my thing. I'd say don't watch it on TV, though. It just does your head in. Uh, just read bits in, in, on websites. There's, and not newspapers, because they're obviously mega-biased. I, I mean, if you can dig the Kremlin bias on it, and it's really obvious, uh, it's, it's a great news channel, uh, RT, uh, I think. <laughs> well, Stephen, that was absolutely fantastic. And I would really like to thank you for coming along here tonight. And I'm sure everybody else would too. So please, a great big hand for thank Barefoot you. Thank Doctor. You. Fantastic stuff. Thanks, Mike.